The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book 4 The Warden and the Wolf King. Chapter 40 Parlay. The boat emerged from the inky blackness with four snakish fangs rowing. The robed figure seemed to hover in the prow like a ghost. The hood of her black robe hung low over her face. The fingers of her thin white hands interlocked at her waist. The swish and plunk of the oars carried across the water and echoed off the riverfront buildings. When she was a stone's throw away from the end of the dock, Gammon stepped forward and raised his sword. That's far enough, he shouted. The stonekeeper raised one hand and the fangs pointed the nose of the boat upstream and worked to keep it in one place. The hooded woman surveyed the screens in silence. Then she slowly reached up and pulled back her cowl. In the orange glow of the torch, her face, framed by her raven hair, shone as white as a moon floating just over the water. She smiled. Gammon, she said in a voice that floated across the surface of the river like a trundle of smoke. I have come to ask for your surrender. You know you cannot win. Why doom your people to their deaths? Gammon drew his sword and pointed it at the sky. We would rather fight you to the death than live another day under Nag's dominion. A flock of crows cawed in the distance, as if in mockery of his words. The woman smiled again. Is your mind made up, then? It is, he answered. Marley felt Gammon's hand tighten around hers, and she didn't think he knew he was squeezing it. And what of your people? She asked, raising her voice and waving a pale hand at the Dugtowners behind him. Are they as foolish as you? Do you all wish to die? Here? Now? On this night? It is not too late. We can give you all new names and new power. Nag extends his hand to you in mercy. Join us, and you too can sing the song of the ancient stone. You will know great power, as do all my children. Is this rotten land worth dying for? The men and women in the marketplace murmured and shifted their feet. Marley knew that Claxton had sent prisoners to the fangs to be changed, and she had heard of this woman with a magic rock and a soothing voice. She noticed that Artham Wingfeather was trembling and looking everywhere but at the woman. Something splashed into the water at Marley's right. She looked back and saw a little boy standing beside Sarah Cobbler. Go away, lady, he shouted. He grabbed a fork from a girl beside him and threw it as far as he could. We fight for Queen Sarah, not you. Dear boy, the stonekeeper said in a soothing voice. Surely the queen you speak of would rather you saw the sun rise than die under the blade of a gray fang. Quiet your tongue, Gammon shouted. I'll not suffer your charms, and neither will these brave Screans. The power you speak of belongs to the Maker alone. We'd rather face your wrath than his. Now be gone, or Earl's arrow will deliver you to the mighty Blap. Earl knocked an arrow and aimed it. The stonekeeper's smile faded. She replaced her hood, gestured to the fangs in her boat, and said, As you wish! The boat veered away and faded into the darkness. The crows in the distance caught again, and Marley, along with many of the Dugtowners, couldn't help but imagine the birds feasting on carcasses. Gammon sheathed his sword and strode back to the shore with a fierce smile that all, that all his army could see. He jumped onto a barrel near the water's edge. We shall live to see the sunrise, Screens. And if we do not, then we go to our graves with the Maker's good pleasure and the blood of freedom staining the ground. Our descendants will sing of this night. The people answered with a half-hearted cheer. Amerlin the Bard played a soulful Anarian tune called Hill and Valley, Horse in Hand. And when it was over, he shouted, Fangs are ugly! Nervous laughter rippled through the crowd. Gammon gave a good speech, Marley thought, and Amerlin's song was nice, 
but they did little to remove the fear from the faces she saw. From the faces she saw. What do we do now? She asked. Gammon tied on his florid sword mask. First, we light every torch tower we can get to. The better we see, the better off we'll be. He nodded at Marley. Then we sharpen our blades and wait. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Four The Warden and the Wolf King. Chapter 41 Story Time with Artham. Sarah sat on the cobbles with Artham and Amerlin the Bard. The orphans, most of whom were asleep, were gathered around as if it were story time. And story time it was. Amerlin the Bard seemed to have grown ten years younger in Artham P. Wingfeather's presence and was sitting cross legged in front of him, asking every question he could think of about the Shining Isle. Artham indulged him, laughing at the Bard's delight over the tiniest details. Sarah widened her eyes at Marley and pointed secretly at Artham as if to say, Can you believe it? After all this time, this was the Artham whom Sarah had been looking for. When he had arrived at the Fork Factory, he spoke with a strong, clear voice, and his eyes were brave and kind. Even with his wings and reddish skin, he, had some, he was somehow handsome. But ever since that day, Artham had lost himself. Sarah was glad he was back. She scooted over to make room for Marley. They sat under the steady glow of the torch towers and listened. Yes, yes, Artham said. There are mountains, but mostly in the center of the island. As the land slopes down to the sea, the hills roll out like a floor of green pillows. Are the mountains snowy in the winter, like it says in the legend of Araman the Brave? Snowy, yes. And when they catch the light at sunrise, they blush like maidens. Tell me about the towns. Are there many? Most of the stories are about ricin. The towns are perfect. What do you mean? Uh, let me put it like this. Imagine you're walking one of the footpaths that cut through the countryside. You have a staff and a rut sack, and after a brisk few hours, you think to yourself, I could use a hearty bowl of limpney snoo right about now. The villagers in Anaria are so perfectly spaced that as soon as you have that thought, you crest a hill and see a village in the valley below and smoke in the chimneys and the smell of hay on the wind. You stroll into town, and after some vibes from the village fount, every village has a fount for travelers, you turn around and you see a little inn or tavern, likely next to an apparelry or a bookstore. There are bookstores? In every town. It's a requirement, you see. Amerlin sighed. You stride into the inn and lean your walking stick by the door, and no sooner than you've sat down and sipped a pint of something warm, the proprietor brings you a bowl of limpney stew. But how does he know? They always have what you want in Anaria. Amerlin looks skeptical, but Arthur continued. It's not that the cooks are magic. It's the land, you see. When you're walking through that part of the island, the shape of the hills, the color of the leaves, the way the light hits the tree trunks, the cool of the morning and the smell of crops, probably limpney sprouts, all contrive to make you want exactly the right thing at the right time. I've never heard of limpney stew, said Amerlin, but I want some, and the same is true of the cooks, I suppose. I mean, they would wake up that morning with limpney stew on the brain? Yes, of course they make a variety of things. Not every traveler wants the same thing at the same time, but when they walk through the door, the proprietor can usually tell by the look of them what they'll need. The people of the Shining Isles are attentive to the way the makers shape the world, but it's not just that. They've all, they're also attentive to the way the maker made the heart. And they're just trying to be good subjects, trying to give one another what they were made to give. So, and in Anaria, what you want and what you need, Hammerlin said, are one and the same. Exactly. That's what the maker intended from the beginning, Artham said. It's not always so, but on the best days, that's how it feels. If the kingdom hadn't fallen apart in the first epoch, thanks to ouster will, I think it would still be that way the world over. As they say, if the weather is bad, it's ouster will. Ouster will, ouster will, he breathes on your ankles beneath your bed, Amerlin chanted. Waits till you're sleeping and sneaks in your head. Borley shivered and scooted closer to Sarah. 
I haven't heard that in a while, Artham said. So Ouster will. He was real too? Amerlin said with a shake of his head. The world is more terrible and more wonderful than I imagined. I've heard that song stuck in my head since I first learned it all at the Whistleharp Academy. Darkens your dreams till you wish you were dead, under the ground on the graveyard hill with Ouster Will, Ouster Will. Orly shivered again, and this time the bard shivered too. I'm surprised that you know it, Artham said. Oh, I know everything about Anaria. Amerlin's eyes twinkled, and he suddenly looked like a little boy. Well, everything you can know without actually going there. I've dreamed of it since I was young. My parents told me about it, fed me a steady supply of books, and once I learned about the Anarian songs, I dedicated my life to keeping them alive here in Scree. Especially after the Great War, the songs seemed to wake up something hopeful in the Screeans. And the Fangs absolutely hate them. Amerlin thought for a moment, then asked, After my Lipney stew at the village tavern, would I stay the night? No! It's only midday, remember? You'd pay the owner and strike out over green fields of Totato and Foot Route and Bloom. You wouldn't need a map, for there are signposts exactly when you need them. And as soon as you were hungry for supper, you'd come upon another village, another fount, another bookstore, and another tavern. You might even be invited in to stay with a farmer for the night. I want to go there, Queen Sarah, Orly said with a yawn. Can we? <sighs> Sarah squeezed Borley. Anaria's on the other side of the ocean, dear. Our home is here in Scree. We don't really have a home anywhere. Borley pointed at the orphans spread across the cobbles of the marketplace like a garden of sleeping children. Don't worry, Sarah said. When this is over, we'll make a home here. Anaria does sound nice, said another voice. Gretelin was awake a few feet away. My ma used to tell me stories when I was a baby. What kind of stories? Said another voice, as small as a mouse. A girl Sarah didn't know sat up and propped herself on her elbows. The same as I told you on your way here, Lona, Amerlin said gently. Remember? Yes, I remember, but I still like to hear them. Me too, Artham said. He stared up at the flames rolling on the torch tower inside. It's a lovely place for a traveler, for the whole land feels like home. Why, if you brought your whistle harp, Amerlin, you'd never want for a meal or a bed. And Arian's treasure music like no one else. And what of the castle? Amerlin asked. Sarah and Marley glanced at each other, then at Artham, who was still staring at the fire. The castle? Artham closed his eyes. It's beautiful. It looks like it grew straight out of the stone itself. Spires, flags flapping in the east wind, smoke rising from chimneys, and children laughing in the courts. It's a beautiful place. How I song to Liet again. Amerlin gave Sarah a confused look. Maybe we should change the subject, Sarah suggested. Artham bobbed his head to and fro and clapped his reddish hands. The claws clacked together oddly. The king, king, king would simply be slighted to have you. Patoo, choo, choo. He grinned and wiped a tear from his cheek. He's my brother, you know. The shing of the king Isle. Shing, shing, shing. What's happening? Amerlin said. A few of the children sat up and looked afraid. Shh, said Marley, scooting over to Artham and stroking his arm. It's all right, sir. But I left him, Artham whimpered. He laid his head on Marley's lap. And now he's dead. I was the throne warden, you know. Sarah tilted his head back and gave him a drink of water. You're still a throne warden. At those words, Artham squinted his eyes and grimaced, weeping silently. Water dribbled out of his mouth and glided across the bright feathers of one wing till it dripped to the ground and disappeared between the cracks of two cobblestones. That was what always happened to her words of comfort, she thought. They passed right over Artham without sinking in and then vanished. Borley crawled over and put his hand on Artham's arm. Then Gretelin placed a soothing hand on his forehead. The little one named Lola bobbled over and laid her head on Artham's shoulder. 
At the sound of his crying, the other orphan, orphans awoke and surrounded poor Artham. Hundreds of innocent hands patting his arms and legs and stroking his wings, saying, Don't cry, Mr. Artham. It's all right. Don't be scared. Artham's eyes remained closed, but his weeping subsided. Then the wind carried a sound out of the darkness from the direction of Torbro. It was the sound of oars splashing, of boats thumping against one another, of trolls grunting and growl moaning, of fangs hissing and snarling. But above, above it all, they heard the sound of crows squawking overhead, messengers of the coming doom. Marley stood and drew her knives as the orphans around her drew their forks and held them out in trembling hands. Amerlin the bard stepped over Artham and moved forward with his whistle harp in one hand. Awake, brothers and sisters of Scree! Gammon screamed from the end of the dock. He stood with his sword in the air. He turned his back to the river so all could see his black hat and mask. The F and S glowed blood red on his chest. Now is the time for courage. We meet the enemy with steady hearts, for dawn has conquered dark since the Maker spoke the world. The night is deep, but light runs deeper. Let our blades and blood proclaim it! Every man, every woman, every child in the market that night raised their weapons and bellowed their defiance of the Fang army and nagged the nameless and every wicked thing that ever soured the sweet world. Their shouts tore across the river Blap and echoed off the walls of the castle Tor, returning to them like a gust of wind and doubling the din. As the shouting died away, thousands of eyes peered into the darkness, gammons first among them, straining to see the first of the Fang boats. The splashing continued, the snarls grew quieter, and Gammon shouted over his shoulder, Make ready!